previously, you know, some issues with cantilevers. And so this is uh, a good study because it's applying a heavy load where in cantilevers, which was where we're doing a lot of our mastication loads. And what they found is that when we had angled implants compared to an axially placed implant, we had about a 17% stress reduction. And that's because of our truss variant design. If we look at stress patterns from Ozon in 2018, finite element analysis, utilizing multiple different inclination models, 100 Newton load on screw retained restorations. And what they found was that the lowest stress value patterns were seen when we tilted the posterior implants. If we look at bone loss patterns with tilted implants, because that was another question, is if we're angling these implants, we have these cantilevers, are we gonna have more bone loss with these implants? Well, in 2012, uh, Ara Ali did a study meta-analysis. And in this study, they had pretty strict inclusion criteria. And what they found was that marginal bone loss patterns between tilted and axial placed implants were similar. And so we know over the years, there's been a number of studies looking at bone loss patterns on straight implants. And if we're now comparing them to angled implants, with all of these studies and these retrospective studies, meta-analysis studies, we can now see that the bone loss patterns are similar. And with the caveat of that, I would say that is if your prosthesis is designed properly, if your occlusion is adjusted properly, and that would really be for both styles of implant. Because if you have a straight implant and you have bad occlusion, you're gonna have problems. If you have an angled implant and you have bad occlusion, you're gonna have problems as well. But we know that if both are designed properly, the bone loss patterns will be similar. And there's a number of studies that have now compared tilted bone loss patterns versus axial or straight bone loss patterns. And we know that they're very, very comparable. So we can really put that to bed we know that there's not really a difference between bone loss patterns in the two styles of implants. So when we are doing a DIA arch or an all on four style procedure or any other name that you wanna give it, what we're talking about is same day full arch implant rehabilitation, okay? And when we're doing this, you really have to change the way that you're thinking because when we're in dental school, we're taught one style of thinking and we're taught to save as many teeth as possible no matter what the cost no matter what the consequence and once you start doing these types of cases these full large same day type of cases you need to change the way that you think you need to change the way that you're viewing some of these cases because you're looking at the greater good of the mouth in the long term and you're taking also into consideration the needs of the patients, the desires of the patients. And this can really uh, change your treatment planning for a lot of these cases. So if we have a case like this, you know, we know there are multiple options. We have conventional dentures that we can utilize. We have snap-on dentures that we can utilize. We've got conventional implants that we can utilize. And we also have an immediate load type procedure, an all on four DR arch type procedure that we can utilize. So we have a lot of different options. So I'm going to show you a case, and this is uh, an old case of mine. And this shows you where, when you're viewing some of these cases, the way that you can possibly change your thinking, because I still get patients every single day. I did consults today you know, one in particular that was very similar to this, where a dentist will treatment plan with uh, you know, a, a very traditional model. And, you know, many patients are not seeking that anymore. They know that there's options such as this available where they can get a new set of teeth that they can function with in one day, as opposed to having to wait for a significant amount of time undergoing many surgeries. And so this case, you know, really highlights this. So if we look at this particular case here, we've got pneumatized sinuses because the patient's been missing his posterior maxillary teeth for a while. 
we have a deficient anterior maxillary ridge. Again, because he's been missing teeth for a while, he's wearing a maxillary partial denture. He's also got some ridge deficiencies in the mandible because he's been missing teeth for a while. He also has some teeth that are angled and not quite in the right position. So he has a number of problems. And so in this particular case, to treat the anterior deficiency, I did maxillary block grafts. So two block grafts in the anterior maxilla, let those heal, come back and I place four implants. Well, we don't have any bone in the posterior sinuses, so we gotta do two sinus lifts. So we do sinus lift on the left, sinus lift on the right, open sinus lifts, and now we can come back and place implants. In the mandible, we had deficient mandibular ridges. And so to treat that, I did bilateral ridge splits. And so uh, many years ago, I wrote an article in Journal of Periodontology on uh, piezoelectric uh, hinge ridge splitting for the mandible. And so this is how we do it. I'll take the piezoelectric handpiece, cut the ridge, green stick fracture, use a ridge splitting acetone, I'll fracture the ridge, let it heal, we come back and we place implants. So we do this on both sides. And then we place a whole bunch of implants. And you can look, we've retained a couple of the natural teeth that were still quote unquote healthy. And we placed a whole bunch of implants. So we see this patient before treatment, this is after all the bone grafting is done. So we look at what did we do? We did sinus lift, sinus lift. We did block grafts, ridge split here, ridge split here. That's a lot of different surgeries, a lot of pain for the patient, a lot of cost for the patient. We then place a whole bunch of implants. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 implants that we have here. And then we do our restorations. So total cost of treatment, we had extractions of bone graft, we had block grafts, sinus lifts, ridge splits, dental implants, implant restorations, sedations during all these surgeries. So total cost for this was at least seventy-four, $75,000 for the patient. And you know, I could tell you this case was done back when I was in the military. And so fortunately it was at no cost to the patient, but I ended up paying for the case. You ended up paying for the case because it's a taxpayer funded case. And this patient, you know, receives some great treatment. But if this was done in a private practice setting, it's going to be fairly expensive. You know, maybe more, even more expensive than this. And the time is going to be fairly significant. So let's look at the time cost of the patient. We had four surgical appointments. We had multiple surgical follow-up visits. You know, so if this is a person that's working out in the civilian world, you know, every one of these surgeries, they have to take off work afterwards to recover from the surgery. Then they have follow-up appointments. They have to take off work for that. Then they have pre-prosthetic appointments. Then they have prosthetic appointments. So the total treatment time is 18 total months, sometimes even longer, and a lot of visits that they're having to come in for. And then even after all of this work is done, because we still have a few natural teeth remaining, it's possible those natural teeth could be crowns, they could need endodontic treatment, they could possibly need to be extracted. And if they're gonna be extracted, they're gonna need bone grafts, additional implants. And so even though the patient had already spent this significant amount of money, there's still a potential that they could spend even more money and they're gonna to have to undergo even more surgeries. And so, this is where if you're looking at a more traditional style of treatment compared to a full arch style of treatment, you know, it changes the way that you look at some of these cases. Because that last case where we did all of that treatment over 18 months of time, I could do this now definitely in one day. I could take those remaining teeth out. I could do uh, a couple of zygomatic implants, a couple of pterygoid implants, implants in the mandible, uh, you know, a vulmar implant. I could get him treated in one day. I don't have to do any bone grafting. I don't have to have him miss all that work that he missed. Uh, it can be, you know, no denture, uh, no partials. So significant difference in the two types of treatment. And Babish actually published an article 
looking at this in 2014, where they had two patient populations. They had conventional implant patients, and they had all in vor style implant patients. And what they found was that these uh, full arch patients, on average, saved at least $14,000, and that they had 12 months shorter treatment times, they had fewer surgeries, fewer follow-up visits, they reported less discomfort, and they reported overall higher satisfaction with their treatment. And this didn't even consider any future possibilities of treatment. So for example, you know, retaining any of those teeth, if any of those teeth go bad, if any of those teeth need root canals in the future, any of those teeth need endodontic treatment in the future, you have to really consider all of those uh, possibilities when you're retaining some of these natural teeth. So let's look at the uh, you know, full arch treatment concept. It's gonna change the way that you see cases and let's look at the surgical procedure. So we're gonna go through all the different steps and really this, uh, in doing this procedure literally every day for the past nearly decade, if you just break this down into steps, it makes it much easier to, uh, to do because you're just doing step one, step two, step three, and the process goes pretty quick and pretty easy. So first, you know, of course, after we're doing our anesthesia and getting the patient comfortable, basically what we're doing is a full thickness flap. When I say full thickness flap, I mean, get under the periosteum. I can tell you, you know, I, I watch a lot of uh, doctors do procedures. You know, I get asked to, uh, you know, mentor a lot of doctors on some of these procedures. And one thing that I see a lot of problem in right off the bat with cases is sometimes uh, clinicians have trouble reflecting the flap and they won't make a very clean incision and they're in such a rush to reflect the flap that they end up uh, essentially doing a split thickness flap because they're not getting under the periosteum and they end up just shredding everything and there's bleeding all over the place. The patient has significantly more pain. They're gonna have a lot more inflammation during the healing process. And literally as the flap gets reflected, because there's periosteum left attached all over the place, I call it, it looks like mushu pork. You know, it's just shredded all over the place. And so get under that periosteum and your flap will just reflect very easy. So full thickness flap, good incision, make sure you get under the periosteum, less bleeding, less post-op inflammation. You'll have less pain for your patient also. They're gonna be a lot happier. And these are consistently, if you have an edentulous patient, reflecting the flap is going to be a bit more difficult. It just always is. It's just a more tenacious periosteal attachment. And when you do your incision, one nice little trick you can do is you do your incision with a you know, 15 or a 15C blade and then flip it around backwards. And then you're using the non-cutting side and just retrace your incision. And when you do that way, it's going to uh, cut any uh, non-incised periosteum is also going to not cut any additional incision lines with your flap. So that's a, sometimes I'll see people and they'll retrace their incision, you know, two or three times with the cutting end of the scalpel and they end up with two or three different incision lines and it creates a mess. So if you do your initial incision line, turn your scalpel around, retrace it with the back of the blade, it makes a nice clean incision. It'll make your life a lot easier. Next, we're gonna extract teeth. A lot of different ways to do that. We'll discuss a few. Then we're gonna do bone reduction. And the bone reduction is one of the biggest problems that I see with practitioners. A lot of practitioners are afraid to remove bone. And look, if you're gonna do full arch procedures, you're gonna to have to remove bone and you're just gonna to have to not be afraid to do it. If you're already you know, deciding that you're going to do this bigger type of case, then you're also gonna to need to decide that I need to reduce bone because in order to have restorations that are going to be restored properly and are not going to fracture and not gonna have problems, you need to reduce bone. In the maxilla, we're typically looking for 12 to 15 millimeters, and I'll show you how to measure for that. And in the mandible, 
20 to 25 millimeters. And uh, I'm talking about utilizing a massage lip ruler with the bone reduction. So I'll, I'll show what I'm talking about with these particular measurements. After our bone is reduced, now we're going to do our implant placement. And then afterwards, we're going to do bone graft placement. Now, some people don't bone graft after these procedures. Sometimes they call it a no bone solution. And you know, I'll show you why I personally like to bone graft. Uh, one of the reasons for that is you never know if you're going to have to come back. You may have an implant that fails. If an implant fails, you will want to have grafted that defect when you had the chance because you may need to utilize that site again. So I can tell you that any defects, any uh, residual extraction sockets, I'm grafting at the time of surgery. Then we need to do tissue reduction. And this is a step like bone reduction where I see a lot of practitioners skimp on this step where they don't even do it at all. This can really make your life a lot easier if you're restoring the cases. And if you're working on a referral basis to where you are uh, a surgeon working with a restoring dentist, this is going to make them much happier. Because when you trim the tissue, it makes a world of difference on the prosthetic end. It makes it easier to do the pickup of the transitional prosthesis. It makes it a lot easier to take your impressions. It makes the final restoration fit a lot better. And it just takes a few extra minutes. So your surgery may take a little bit longer, but it's gonna make a world of difference. And I say a lot of people just skip this step entirely. Then we need closure. And I'm gonna show you a suture technique that I've come up with over the years that uh, works extremely well. It's very effective. You never get any open flaps. And uh, once you learn the technique, I think your patients will like it, and I think you'll like it as well. Let's talk about step number one, flap elevation. So we're doing a full thickness flap. So you can see in this case, we're under the periosteum, very easy to do a full thickness flap. And when we are doing this incision design, one thing that I'll do is I'll just come straight across and eliminate the papillas you know and as being a periodontist just saying that you know can get you uh, literally excommunicated from the church of periodontics because you're getting rid of papillas but when you're suturing this you don't need the papillas anymore and so as long as there's enough keratinized tissue then we are just going to cut across at the cejs and eliminate those papillas and if you look here you can see after I've reflected the flap where I still have these papillas remaining and I'm literally going to just eliminate those. But when I go back to suture my flap, it's going to make a much cleaner closure. And that's because we have a nice straight line incision as opposed to a uh, jagged type incision because we retain papillas. All right, next we're going to do teeth extraction. And when we do teeth extraction, there's a lot of different ways to do this. And uh, what I will typically do is I will go in between the teeth with uh, a burr. I will eliminate a little bit of bone. I will section all of the molars um, just to I don't like to chase any fractured root tips. So anything I could do to eliminate root tips, um, I'm gonna try to do ahead of time. But there's a variety of different ways to do this. Some people will use a sagittal saw and then we'll literally just cut through the bone and take all the teeth out with the bone. And then they'll go back and get the little root tips afterwards. So whichever way works best for you is fine. Just you wanna get the teeth out in one piece, you wanna preserve as much bone as possible. Uh, some people I see get in a very big rush and in the attempt to take all these teeth out, they start fracturing buckle plates left and right. Well, you're gonna want those buckle plates later. So you wanna keep all that bone. So if you need to take a few extra minutes to section a tooth, then section the tooth because the key here is you need to keep as much bone as possible. So once you have these teeth out, now we're gonna do bone reduction. And you can see in certain cases, we're going to need to take 
a pretty significant amount of bone away. And so on this particular case, you can see on the right side, I've got about nearly nine millimeters of vertical bone reduction. And now we're gonna go back and do this on the left side. You know, so how do you determine how much bone to reduce? I get that question quite a bit. And a simple way, a very simple way to do this is you get a Mossad lip ruler. And these lip rulers are used uh, you know, very commonly for uh, denture fabrication and they're available. You can get them on Amazon and they cost, I think like 10 bucks on Amazon. And a Mossad lip ruler, you know, how do we utilize this? Well, on the back side of the Mossad lip ruler is a little notch. And so after we do our full thickness flap reflection and we take the teeth out, we take this little notch, which is right here on the back side, and you will place that directly onto the bone. And once you place that onto the bone, then you let the lip rest. And that is the measurement that you're looking at. When the lip is resting, and the ruler sitting on the bone in the maxilla, if we're doing a hybrid type restoration with say a titanium bar and acrylic, or you can, we're looking for about 15 millimeters from bone to lip. If we are doing a zirconia, then we can have a little bit less, you know, say 12 millimeters. In the mandible, we're utilizing the other end of this. So we're utilizing the little lip down here and we're placing that on the bone and then we're measuring to where the lip position is. So in the mandible, we're looking for about on average 20 to 25 millimeters on the mandible. That doesn't mean your restoration is gonna be that thick. That's just after the bone reduction and the lip is resting. That's what we're looking for with the massage. Okay, so you can see on a case here, on the left side, I am placing the Mossad lip ruler with the notch directly onto the bone after we've taken the teeth out. I'm letting the lip, the lip rest, and you can see we've got, looks like somewhere around eight millimeters. And then after I do all the bone reduction, then I place the Mossad lip ruler onto the bone after the reduction. And now you can see I've got about 14 millimeters or so. So I've got plenty of room now to make a restoration where I can hide the prosthetic transition line, that I have adequate thickness, that I'm not going to have to worry about this restoration breaking. Now, when you're doing bone reduction, of course, you need to be cognizant of how much bone you have. So if doing that amount of bone reduction is gonna eliminate all the bone that you have, then you don't necessarily wanna do that. So you have to keep you know, all factors in mind to where you're satisfying the prosthetic end and the surgical end. And this is where, you know, your pre-surgical analysis, looking at the smile line, looking at the bone availability is coming into play in doing these procedures. All too often I see practitioners, they, you know, have a patient come in and they just are straight looking at the x-ray and they're really not considering some of these other factors such as the lip mobility, the smile height, and those are some of the things that you need to look at because when you do your prosthesis, you need to hide that transition line. You need to have an adequate thickness of material in your restoration. And in order to do that, you're going to have to do bone reduction. And this is a simple way to determine how much bone reduction to do. Bone reduction, you can do this a variety of ways. We use an Osteomed, uh, just high powered handpiece in the clinic. Uh, some people, you know, utilize Hall's hand pieces. Some people utilize uh, piezoelectric hand pieces, which, you know, I think take way too long. But however you're going to use it, just make sure you're doing an adequate amount of bone reduction. Okay, so you can see after we do our bone reduction in this case, everything's nice and flat, nice and even then make sure you're also rounding any sharp edges because when you go to suture the flap, we don't want any sharp edges that could possibly perforate or flap. And what we're doing in the mandible and the maxilla is we're creating what's called a bone shelf. And so Jensen published uh, a number of articles about 10 years ago, the maxillary bone shelf and the mandibular bone shelf. And this is a nice little 
uh, picture here because we look at a mandible and we can see that originally what we had was a knife ridge mandible. However, once we reduce this, you can see that we now have a nice thick area, a nice shelf to place our implants. Whereas if we hadn't done this bone reduction, you know, this area up here, you know, it's much too thin. We're gonna have a lot of threat exposure of our implants. But when we get down to here, we have a ton of bone to place our implants. And so we want to create this shelf. In order to do that, you can see we had to do quite a bit of bone reduction, but it ends up accomplishing our goal in creating a space where we can place implants and not have any exposed threads and have adequate prosthetic restorative space. So again, in the maxilla, we're doing the same thing, the maxillary bone shelf. So purpose of bone reduction, why are we doing that? You know, I've hit it a few times, we're trying to create prosthetic space. Remember, when we're doing these surgery procedures, they need to really be prosthetically driven because no one ever comes to see you saying, I want implants. They want teeth. They want teeth to chew with, they want teeth to smile with, and it's great that you can place implants, but if they're not placed in the right spot and you can't do your prosthetics, then your implants are pretty much worthless, even if they're integrated in bone. We need to have the prosthetics in mind at the end of the day. So we wanna have proper thickness for a strong restoration that's not going to fracture. We want to eliminate the uh, prosthetic transition line. We don't want anyone seeing the edges of our restoration. We want to eliminate any canting. We want to eliminate any uh, uh, tilting of our occlusal plane. We want to also eliminate any infected bone and bone reduction will do this. And we know that as we move apically, typically the bone in most cases gets thicker and that's going to be good for our implant placement because we're going to have more bone uh, peri uh, circumferentially around the implants. Now one little trick that works very nicely is you can take a fox plane. And if you remember a fox plane from dental school, if you're making uh, dentures in your clinic, take a fox plane, you sterilize that, and then we'll place that directly onto the bone after bone reduction. And now we can utilize that fox plane to parallel the interpupillary lines, Frankfurt horizontal plane, and it is very handy. And I've done, you know, thousands of these cases and I still use a fox plane, you know, for every single maxillary case. And that tells me if I need to adjust one side more than the other, tells me if my posterior maxilla has dropped more than the anterior, my bone reduction, and it's a, it's a very good uh, quick visual check. Okay, so after we have all our bone reduction done, now we're going to place our implants. And when we're placing our implants, you know, in the mandible, certain things that we want to keep an eye out for are going to be the mental foramen. And you want to reflect your flap adequately to where you can see the mental foramen. Now, a lot of times I'll see practitioners do this procedure and they're not adequately reflecting the flap and they can't see where the mental foramen is. If you're going to do this procedure, you need to be able to see this. And also, if you notice on this flap reflection, you can see it's very clean. There's no mushu pork anywhere. I don't see shredded periosteum all over the place because when you get under the periosteum, it'll reflect very quick and simple and you'll have a nice clean area to work with. And also it's gonna really minimize the amount of bleeding that you're going to have. So when you're placing these implants in the mandible especially, definitely 100% you gotta find the mental foramen. Okay, now our implant insertion. And this is actually a picture from one of the implants that we placed today. And now we are placing our implant into our osteotomy. And when we're placing this, we wanna achieve really as high insertion torque as we can get. And I'll explain to you why. You know, is lower torque a problem? And if you look at nearly every all in four style study, when they look at implant failures, they almost always have one thing in common. And that one common thing is low initial insertion torque value. 
you know, so what is the minimal amount of torque required? And we look at a number of different studies. You know, there's tons of study in the lit. And, you know, some of them I published myself. Typically, for insertion torque, you're seeing anything from 32 to 35 Newton centimeters of torque, somewhere in the low to mid 30s is ideally what we're looking for. Now, there are some studies that have looked at low torque. You know, is low torque a problem? Well, the GD in 2012 found that if you have at least two implants that have greater than 25 Newton centimeters of torque, they will help to stabilize other implants that have less than 20 Newton centimeters of torque. And then you still get very high implant survival rates, over 98%. So basically you have a team and the stronger implants are supporting the weaker implants. So during this initial osseointegration phase, you know, during that first eight week healing period where you have uh, you know, bone dying back and then bone healing and uh, forming and uh, osseointegration happening with the implants, these stronger insertion torque implants are gonna support the weaker insertion torque implants. Now Jensen in 2014 published a study where they had implants with torque values of as little as 15 Newton centimeters and they were achieving up to 100% implant survival as long as they had what we mentioned earlier in the lecture, cross arch stability and splinting. Because when we're taking this arch restoration and we're screw retaining them to multiple implants, we're spreading the work, we're spreading the load. So now you don't have forces concentrated in one area, they're concentrated throughout the entire arch. And that is one of the reasons that we can immediately load these cases as opposed to other, say, single implant style of cases where we may not necessarily be able to immediately load these. And so you know, these studies show that you know, if we have less insertion torque, it can work. Now, after doing many thousands of these cases over you know a decade period of time and with my personal opinion on low torque not good i hate low torque that's usually a bad day in the clinic especially in the past before i was doing uh, zygomatics and pterygoids and some of these other styles of implants if i had a low torque day if i had soft bone it was a bad day because that meant it's going to be difficult to load our case so in my clinic, you know, if we had torque that was less than 32 Newton centimeters, you know, what could we do? And some of these things are used to, you know, what I used to do in the past, and I can tell you what I do now, but we could attempt to place a wider implant. So say you place a 4.2 millimeter implant, and you're not getting quite the insertion torque that you want, then you could place a five millimeter implant. As a matter of fact, I did that just today, just a few hours ago. And I'll show you that at the end of the lecture when I put up the pictures of the cases we did today. We can attempt to place a longer implant. And of course, you need to be cognizant of the anatomy to do that. You know, if you're in the mandible, you need to be aware of where your inferior alveolar nerve is. If you're in the maxilla, you need to be cognizant of you know, where your sinuses are, where your nasal cavity is. So if you're placing a longer implant, you know, can you place a longer implant? Are you going to impinge on any of those anatomic structures? but that's another option that you have. You can seek an alternative location for your implant. Now, many times when we're doing these procedures, alternative locations are a luxury that we don't have because we, many cases, we don't have significant amounts of bone. You know, and if you have a patient that just has acres and acres of bone and one spot doesn't work, then you have the luxury of choosing another spot. But many times we don't have that luxury. And one thing that you can do, and you know, for me it was out of necessity, just because we see a lot of different types of cases, is you could start doing other, what I call exotic styles of implants, pterygoid implants, zygomas, vomers, piriform rim implants, uh, you know, inferior border of the mandible implants, because you're looking for these areas where there's dense, hard basal or bone, to help give you higher amounts of insertion torque. Another option that you have, and again, this is if you have the luxury of enough bone to do it, is you can place additional implants. And I can tell you in the past, that was my go-to. You know, 
before I was doing some of these other styles of implants, you know, I would place a wider implant. I would try to place a longer implant. I would try to place additional implants because I was trying to get more implants that I could spread the load. I can uh, distribute the stress of the restoration to all these additional implants. So we see a case here where I've got one, two, three, four, five, six implants in here because either the bone was soft or it was a big patient, big strong guy patient, and I needed a little bit more support for our restoration. This is an interesting case because in this case, I needed a longer implant. I utilized a Norris Medical uh, Terry Fit implant, 22 millimeters, to engage the inferior border of the mandible because this patient just had extremely soft, hollow bone in this area and I could get absolutely zero torque. And as you can see, I had you know, a relatively small implant posteriorly and I really wanted some torque in this area. And the only way that I could achieve it was by going to the inferior border of the mandible. Well, the only way I could reach the inferior, inferior border of the mandible is I needed to utilize a longer implant. And that meant I had to get a 22 millimeter, basically pterygoid style implant that could engage that dense bone at the inferior border. And so this case actually worked very, very well, no problems, and uh, it was a good solution. We can utilize other areas. So in this particular case, you know, utilize the pterygoid because we have dense bone in the pterygomaxillary complex, the pyramidal process of the palatine bone, the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone, you know, dense, hard type one bone that is in the, uh, you know, a sea of the very soft type four bone that is typically found in the posterior maxilla. We've got zygomatic implants, extremely strong bone in the zygoma. You know, and if you see a case like this, you know, somebody that was previously edentulous, they have very minimal bone. When we utilize zygomatic implants, pterygoid implants, we're able to engage in a very dense hard bone that's going to give us a lot of posterior support where we're doing a lot of our mastication back in the molar area. And then in the anterior, in this case, we utilized engaging the vomer. Another area of dense hard bone in the anterior maxilla that if we need it in a pinch, we can engage the vomer and that helps quite a bit because many times the anterior maxilla will be extremely soft. And so these are some alternative locations that when we're doing standard all on X style procedures that we can utilize to engage. Now, once we have our implants placed and we have adequate insertion torque everywhere, now we need to do a little bit of housekeeping. We need to look at the platform and we need to make sure that we have unimpeded access so we can see our abutments. Because if you have any bone in the way, when you're going to see these abutments, you're not going to get complete seating. And what happens is you may feel like your torque is adequate when you're seating the abutment, but the implant platform uh, is not completely engaging the abutment. And then what'll happen is you may have some of this bone necrosis as healing occurs. You know, anytime you reflect a flap, you get a little bit of bone loss. Anytime you do a little bit of bone reduction, you're going to get a little bit of additional bone loss afterwards. And now, if your platform wasn't fully seated on your abutment, now you have a loose abutment. And loose abutment can cause loose uh, screws, can cause fractured screws, can cause fractures of your transitional restorations, ultimately can even cause failure of your implant. And so what you want to do is take a high speed uh, you know reverse air handpiece we use a you know simple 45 degree reverse air handpiece and ramp the bone and so we'll take the bone down clear an area around the platform and this is going to do a few things one it is going to allow your abutment to fully seat the other thing it's going to do when you ramp this when i do a ramp i like to create a long sloping ramp. So if you look here, this kind of slopes all the way back to here. And you can even see a couple of my little chatter marks on here when I did the reduction. And you know, some 
companies will sell a uh, you know a profile kit where you can screw a little instrument into your implant and you just uh, you know drill down and it creates a little bit of uh, clearance around the implant well that's fine and that allow you to seat your abutment the problem that you're going to run into later down the road is if you do it that way the tissue you know follows the bone and you know in perio we had a saying it was you know the tissue is the issue and the bone sets the tone and you know if you don't adequately ramp this bone if you don't smooth this and you just take a tiny bit away right around here and you leave all this excess bone all in these other areas you'll be able to seat your abutment but the problem is after all the tissue heals that bone is still going to support all that tissue and you're going to have a lot of excess tissue in the way it's going to make it difficult to take impressions it's going to make it difficult to seat your restoration so if you can ramp the bone and make this much more gradual it'll make life a lot easier especially on the restoring dentist and if you're the restoring dentist you are going to appreciate it and if you're restoring dentist or referrals they're going to also appreciate it because if every time they get one of your cases they have a whole bunch of soft tissue they have to deal with they may not refer anything to you anymore if the other guy that refers them patients you know is doing adjustments and you know, it's much easier to take impressions on the cases that come from that person. You know, they may not refer to you anymore. So take a few extra minutes, ramp the bone, clear away the platform. It's going to make life a lot better for you, a lot better for your restoring dentist. So then we're going to do an abutment access check. And if you're still doing uh, conventional dentures and, uh, you know, a lot of digital uh, is going on, and we do a lot of digital in our clinic. But if you're still doing traditional uh, implants, uh, uh, dentures with your implants, one thing that works well is you can cut three little channels like this. And this is something that we did for many years. And you create three little channels like this, because typically that's going to be about your implant positions, somewhere in the uh, incisor area, somewhere in the uh, premolar molar area. And when you seat this, when you put your multi-unit abutment on with the pin, you can see where your exit point is. So this gives you a quick little check to see if you're going to have adequate clearance and that if you need to change your abutment angulations. Because I can tell you that one of the things that is the biggest pain is you have everything finished, you have everything sutured, and now you have, say, a 17-degree abutment in one area, and now you find out that that's going to be coming out a little bit too facial. And now you got to change that 17 degree abutment to a 30 degree abutment. And it's just a lot more difficult to do when you already have everything sutured. So if you can place your prosthetic on here with a couple of access channels, you can see that you can see where your abutment's coming out. It just ensures that you're going to have a lot better placement and a lot less uh, changing of abutments after you have everything already sutured. And so you can see in the posterior we're checking and the anterior we're checking and we know we're in the right spots. Now we're gonna attach healing caps, and then we're gonna do tissue reduction. And so you can see in some of these cases, you know, in the top left, you can see there was quite a bit of bone reduction done in this case. You can see that, you know, now my flap, you know, I've got about 13 millimeters of excess tissue in this area. And so afterwards, we're doing a lot of soft tissue trimming. In the top right picture, you can see that's a UNC 15 probe. So this is 15 millimeters. And if you look at the size, and that's 15 millimeters here. So some of these tissue chunks you know, are pretty substantial. And we're utilizing you know, sharp 15C blades, uh, 12B blades. And that's one thing is, you know, if you're doing these procedures, don't be afraid to utilize a bunch of new blades. You know, some of these blades, you use them a couple of times, they get dull very quickly. And then it's literally like you're trying to cut tissue with a butter knife. You know, it costs an extra five bucks, use a new blade, trim the tissue. It cuts a lot smoother. It makes your life a lot easier. It also makes the patient have a lot less pain because they get a lot cleaner cut. So trim the tissue. After you trim the tissue, one other thing that you can utilize is a biopsy punch and the biopsy punch will also help to trim a little bit of tissue away. 
and it will allow you to get a much cleaner closure. And so yes, it will take a few extra minutes if you're doing it this way, but again, at the end of the day, it's gonna make your life a lot easier. The patient's actually going to heal a lot better because they're gonna have a much cleaner closure, a much less redundant tissue. Uh, next, bone graft placement. Again, as I mentioned earlier, if I have any residual sockets, if I have any defects, I'm placing bone. And, you know, and why am I placing bone? Because if you look at a patient like this, where you have a number of large defects, when we graft these areas, if we had an issue where an implant failed, and we needed to come back to say either of these areas where we have bone loss. Now, hopefully with our bone grafting, we're going to have bone in those areas that we could utilize in the future if it ever needed to be done. And so here you can see we have a nice amount of bone formation. If we need to go back there, we could. Now, soft tissue closure. So in doing soft tissue closure, you know, one comment that we typically receive in the office is uh, compliments on our closure. And, you know, just that it's very clean, that it makes it uh, very easy for the restoring dentists. And I can tell you that in doing this, um, it's a technique that I've developed over the years. And I just use four ochromic gut sutures for almost every single case in the office. You know, over the years, you know, in the past, I used to have a variety of sutures, which a lot of clinics have. You know, you'll have uh, chromic gut sutures for certain procedures and uh, vicral sutures for other procedures and PTFE sutures and silk sutures and, you know, nylon sutures. And, uh, I can tell you, one of my colleagues years ago told me, you know, just to use chromic gut. And I said, no, that's not going to work. You know, it's too weak. You know, it won't work. And he said, no, 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 give it a try. So I did. And I can tell you that for many, many years now, all I've used in the clinic is chromic gut. And it works spectacularly well, especially for this technique. When you're doing full arch, you know, if you want to use uh, a resorbable suture, you know, the benefit of that is when the prosthes prosthesis is seated at that first follow-up visit, you don't have to go dig out all those sutures. And when you have a uh, prosthetic that uh, is sitting on top of a bunch of non-resolvable sutures, you have to go get those out. And that's a pain to do. Or you have to take the restoration off and you have to go dig them all out. So if you can utilize a resorbable suture, it makes your life a lot easier. So you know, how are we doing this? Well, I call this the Texas two-step closure. The reason I call it two-step closure is basically I'm utilizing two sutures for the entire arch. And when I make two sutures, I'm basically doing one knot, knot in the midline. And I'll start right up here. And then what I'm doing is I'm considering each of these areas as a section. Okay, so I've got a section here here, 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 and here. And basically between each section, I'm doing two sutures essentially. First, I start off with a horizontal mattress. Okay, when I do the horizontal mattress suture, what that is doing is one, it everts the tissue. So it is flipping the tissue to where the connective tissue of each portion of the flap is going to connect and kiss the connective tissue of the other portion of the flap. That's gonna make things heal much better. If you don't evert the tissue like this, then many times what you'll have is connective tissue of one side of the flap is uh, being covered by epithelium of uh, the other side of the flap. And that's just not going to heal very well. You get flap separation. So if you do a horizontal mattress suture first, then, this is all one continuous suture. So you're doing your horizontal mattress first, and then after that, then you go back and do a continuous loop suture. And what that continuous loop suture does is it now tucks down and compresses that everted tissue. And so that first horizontal mattress 
in addition to everting the tissue, it is basically taking all of the tension off of the incision line. So now your incision line is tension free. And now you're utilizing that continuous loop suture to close the incision line. There's no tension on it. And after you close this section, then basically you do a horizontal mattress across and the same thing. You pass underneath, you come out here, horizontal mattress here, come back here, horizontal mattress here, come out here, and then you go back and loop it back. Then you go to the next section, horizontal mattress, horizontal mattress, loop it back. And when you close it like that, everything is gonna be very tight, very clean. And in order to also do that, you also have to trim the tissue beforehand. And so there's a lot of little bits of tissue trimming and it takes a few extra minutes to suture this way, but it makes it a lot cleaner. It makes it a lot better for your uh, prosthetic portion of the treatment. And so again, when we're doing this, it's two total sutures for the entire arch. And if you notice with this suturing technique, you don't see a whole bunch of suture tails everywhere. And that's also beneficial because when you're doing your pickup of your transitional restoration, you don't have all these extra suture tails that can get caught up in your acrylic when you're picking up the transitional cylinders. So you basically have one suture tail in the middle and one suture tail at the end, and that's it. Everything else is very nice and clean. So in doing these procedures, you know, another thing to consider is how many implants are we going to place in an arch? And this is something that you know a lot of dentists can't answer. And I'll have a lot of patients that will come in for consultations and they'll say, well, how many implants do you put in? I said, well, basically I put in as many implants as I need for the procedure. And they said, well, you know, I went to so-and-so's office and they told me that they always put in six implants and that six is better than four. I said, well, really? I said, well, why is that? I said, why is six better than four? And they said, well, I, you know, they just said it was because it's more implants. I said, well, there's plenty of studies out there that show four implants are more than adequate. You know, why do they put in six? You know, they really can't give you an answer other than, Six is bigger than four. I was like, okay, well, spectacular. You're a genius. Six is bigger than four. But why do you need six? Well, there's a reason. And we make these decisions during surgery. So we look at these cases. You know, in the top left, we've got six implants on the top. We've got six in the bottom. In the middle, we also have six implants, but a little different design. In the bottom, we have four. You know, is one of these better than the other? No. It all depends on the case. Each one's individual. So how are we going to decide which case is going to need four? What's going to need five? What's going to need six? How do you make that determination? Well, we have to look at a number of different things. We have to look at the dimension of the smile. When I say dimension of the smile, I'm talking about how much lip mobility there is. So when somebody smiles, you know, do they just show the incisal edges or do they show all of the incisor and some of the gingiva? You know, also how wide is their smile? You know, are they showing all the way back to the second molars? You know, some people have very, very big, wide, wide smiles. Some people have very narrow smiles. We also need to consider the anterior posterior spread or the AP spread. We need to consider the composite torque value. And we'll discuss what that is. Basically, the insertion torque for all of the implants, if we add that up, what does it add up to? And is it enough to give us a predictable, uh, successful outcome for our restoration? We need to consider the dimensions of the bone that we're putting the implants into. We need to consider the size of the patient and any possible parafunctional habits that the patient may have. So if you look at this patient when she smiles, this is somewhat of a normal smile. Now, I'll always ask the patient to give me a smile and then I will tell them, okay, go ahead and smile now as big as you can. And so when this patient smiles much bigger, we can see that she shows a lot more teeth. She shows almost all the way back to the second molars. She shows a lot of gingival tissue. And you may say, well, you know, patients don't typically smile like that. Well, I can tell you that a lot of patients do smile like that. And a lot of patients, when they're laughing and 
interacting with people and not thinking about their smile, you know, sometimes they will smile with a very strong, big, exaggerated smile. And you need to be cognizant of this before your procedure is done because it can really cause you a lot of problems that you can't fix if you haven't considered it ahead of time. So if we look at a patient like this and they have a you know, xerostomia, so they have a lot of recurrent decay and a lot of these restorations. And so they're uh, needing full arch treatment referred from their dentist. And so we're gonna trace their sinuses. And so we can see that the sinuses extend all the way up to the canines. And so if we're gonna place implants in the traditional, uh, say, you know, all on four style full arch immediate load protocol and placing four implants, typically our restoration is going to extend about to the first molars if we didn't want an excessively long cantilever. Now this patient has lived her whole life with a full set of teeth all the way back to the second molars. And she has a very, very wide smile. So when she smiles, you can see all the way back to the second molar. So if we just restore with this, then when she smiles, we're going to see the you know, end of the restoration. We're gonna see a little black space in the buccal corridor posterior to the restoration because this patient shows all the way to the second molars. Now, if we extend the cantilever to try to hide this, well, now we're getting a new situation where our cantilever is too long. And when our cantilever is too long, now we have possibilities of prosthetic fracture, screw fracture, abutment fracture, you know, even implant failure. You know, so we don't want to have that happen. And so in this particular case, the way that we can help our all on X style restoration is by adding some additional support. And to do that, for this case, we could use pterygoid implants. So now we have our traditional style treatment all on X where we can utilize, say, our Norris Medical Tough implants. And then we could utilize the Norris Medical Terry uh, Fit implants posteriorly to give us a little bit of additional support and eliminate cantilever. And so we have this case and ended up treating it like this, where now we have full extension all the way back to the second molars. So when the patient smiles, we aren't seeing any black triangles or any black spaces. The patient has the full extent of her dentition, which she's been used to her entire life. And you know, the patient really doesn't miss a beat from what she had before to what she has now. Another thing to consider in how many implants that we're going to place is the size of the patient. So if we look at the patient on the left, you know, a much smaller patient, we look at the patient on the right, a much bigger patient. You know, so one of these patients is more than likely going to generate a much stronger biting force than the other patient. And in doing so, we're going to want additional support for those teeth and prosthetics because, you know, uh, that strength of bite force is going to be significantly different between these two patients. Another thing to consider is any parafunctional habits that a patient may have, you know, especially bruxism. Uh, you know, when a patient is a known bruxer or has other uh, comorbidities such as uh, restless leg syndrome. So that's one thing that, um, you know, has come to bite me in the past is patients that have restless legs. So that is one thing I would definitely ask all your patients if you're considering uh, a full arch immediate load procedure. Because uh, when patients have restless leg, they tend to brux very hard at nighttime. Um, and when they're bruxing, they're generating you know, very high amounts of force on the dentition, which is being transmitted to your implants. So in a patient that's a known bruxer, uh, I'm going to try to over-engineer that case as much as possible. I'm going to try to place in additional implants in the uh, likelihood that anything might fail then I have backups that I can still hopefully keep my prosthesis, even though one of my implants may have been overloaded. Also, by having additional implants, I've increased the total amount of bone to implant contact. 
I've increased the total amount of composite torque value that I have to spread the load between all the different implants in the restoration. And so in a patient like this, you can see that we had a number of implants. This patient was a very heavy bruxer and this implant ended up failing. But because that implant had teammates to spread the load, even though this one implant failed, we did not lose the restoration and the patient can still function. And this has now been many years in function without that one particular implant and we didn't have any problem. And the patient never really missed a beat other than us taking out the one particular implant that failed because we over-engineered the case. We have additional implants uh, to back up in case something did fail. And that was basically because this patient was a known heavy bruxer. So we talked about composite torque value. You know, what is this? So Jensen mentioned this in a 2015 article in Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry. And basically, the number that Jens refers to is 120 newton centimeters of composite torque value or cumulative value of the insertion torque for all of the implants. So basically, if you're placing, say, four implants and your four implants have 30 newton centimeters of torque for each implant, you have 120 newton centimeters of torque. And so this number is a rough go by that if you can achieve 120 newton centimeters of torque with all of your implants, then you know you have a fairly good chance of survivability for your prosthesis. And so if you're placing implants that have lower amounts of torque, you know, how can you deal with that? And that's what we covered earlier in the lecture, where you can place uh, additional implants. So now you place an additional one or two implants, you know, have some additional torque that you can add into your CTV, or you can place different sizes of implants that hopefully can increase your torque values for the individual implants that you do have. So here's a case looking at increasing composite torque value. And in this case, we have uh, an 80 plus year old gentleman and he was missing his posterior teeth wearing a partial denture that he was looking to get rid of. And he had some implants in the anterior, but the implants in the anterior were having quite a bit of facial thread exposure. I can tell you the bone up here was fairly thin and we could see that the roots on the remaining maxillary teeth were very small. Those teeth were very mobile and the implants uh, had a lot of thread exposure because of the bone loss around the implants, the thin bone in this area. And we look at the sinuses, we can see they're very pneumatized. And I offered zygomatic implant treatment to this patient and he declined based on his age. And so what we decided to do as an alternative was sinus lifts on both sides. And so I did bilateral sinus lifts. And you know, the bone in the anterior was very, very thin and we weren't able to place any implants there. But because of the bilateral sinus lifts, we were able to place implants in the posterior. And you could see that some of the implant sizes were not quite as robust. And we're placing this into regenerated bone, which is a bit uh, on the softer side. And in order to increase some additional torque for these implants, for our composite torque value, I went ahead and added two pterygoid implants. And by adding the two pterygoid implants, I was able to engage some dense, hard type one bone with very high insertion torque. And that was able to add that additional torque to our composite torque value. So in doing these all on X style cases, we've covered you know, the process of how we're gonna do them. You, know, you run into many situations where you need what I call a rescue implant. And once you learn how to do these and master these, it will really make your life a lot easier. So some of these can be pterygoid implants. And in pterygoid implants, we're trying to gauge the pterygomaxillary complex. And again, another case, in this case, this patient had a uh, very anterior sinus on the right side. So I did a standard all on X style case, four implants on the top, four on the bottom. And because the sinus extended so far anteriorly in this case, I did a trans sinus implant. Now, unfortunately, that particular implant failed. And because that implant failed, now I have to do something about it. You know, so my options are, I can either do a sinus lift, 
And if I do a sinus lift, I have to let all this bone heal. And while all that bone is healing, this patient still has a transitional restoration. Now, if I extend the transitional restoration to where it was, you know, my terminal support is now here. So I've got this very long cantilever and there's very high chance this is gonna fracture here now and possibly cause problems for this implant. So that's one option if I was going to do the sinus lift. You know, another option I could do as a rescue scenario is I can place a pterygoid implant back here. I know I can engage really dense hard bone. I could take this implant out. I could graft this site and then I could take the transitional restoration, extend it back, attach it to the pterygoid. So now I don't have to put the patient in a shortened restoration. Uh, the patient can still function. The patient can still smile. And it really doesn't delay the treatment for any significant amount of time. And so that's what we did. So I went ahead and took out the failed implant, placed a pterygoid implant on the right side, extended the restoration to join that pterygoid implant. And then I offered the patient placing one on the left side to balance out the restoration, and he agreed to do that. And again, if we have any issues like this in the clinic, we don't charge the patient for doing any of these additional surgeries. It's just part of the process. And now we can see that uh, we have a full restoration, that now we have no cantilevers in the maxilla, and the patient uh, did not have to undergo additional surgery of a sinus lift, and it was a way to rescue our all-on X style procedure. Enterocoid implants have a very good survival rate, uh, very similar to traditional uh, standard implants, and we don't need to go into a whole lot of review of that because it's in other lectures that we uh, are putting on with Norris Medical. Other styles of rescue implants for all-on X procedures can be piriform rim implants. And the piriform rim, we're basically looking at the aperture of the nose, and this bone is a very dense, hard bone, and you can extend your implants to engage that bone with the apical portion of the implant, and that can rescue you in certain situations where you need to have increased amounts of torque for your all on X style procedures. The vomer. So the vomer is a, another area of bone that we can get uh, dense, hard uh, insertion torque with. And this bone is uh, essentially uh, up in the base of the nose. And we can angle these implants and engage this when we're in a pinch and we need some anterior anchorage. And so you can see in this case, we've anchored into the vomer. And then we are also utilizing zygomas, pterygoids, uh, so we can get support in the maxilla from these harder uh, stronger type one bone sources. So another good spot that you can turn to is the vomer. So Jensen in 2015 published a study where they were looking at piriform rim implants and vomer implants. They had a you know, number of patients, 44, 180 implants just about. You know, again, very severely trophic maxillus. And they had very good insertion torque, you know, close to 45 Newton centimeters of torque because they're engaging type one basilar bone. And their survival rate was very high, close to 97%. Another rescue implant you can utilize is a zygomatic implant. And so in this case, this patient, uh, we did not have great insertion torque, so we placed additional implants. And unfortunately, some of these implants ended up failing, two here. And so the way we treated that was by removing the two failed implants, placing a zygomatic implant on the right side, and because we only had a very small implant that was engaging septal bone in the left maxillary sinus, we went ahead and uh, engaged the zygoma on the left side as well. You know, in some of these cases, in hindsight, it would be better to plan these uh, with a zygoma right away uh, or plan these with a pterygoid in a zygoma right away. But if you get into a situation where you have implant failures, then at least you know you have options to salvage the case. So some common problems with these all on X style cases, one is pre-existing implants, 
And that's pretty easy to solve. There's uh, a number of implant retrieval tools that are made and you can very easily remove these implants in most cases uh, without too much difficulty. Inadequate bone reduction. And so when people are doing inadequate bone reduction, it can result in very uh, unsightly restorations, restorations that have significant fracturing. And believe it or not, this patient is in a final restoration. That is not a temporary restoration. That is a final restoration that was made. And you can see that there was very inadequate bone reduction. We've got a ridge lap here because the bone was not reduced adequately. And when this patient smiles, we could see some of the transition line in these areas. And so just not a very aesthetic restoration. And a lot of that started from the inadequate bone reduction. And so when I see a restoration like this, the first thing that goes through my mind is inadequate bone reduction because I can see where these platforms are. These platforms are not even to the CEJ of these teeth in the restoration. So there's no way that this had adequate bone reduction when this case was done just by looking at the restoration that was made. Another case, you can see this restoration. We know that there was inadequate bone reduction performed because you could see there's flanges. There's just not very much thickness of this restoration. And we can see when this patient smiles, we see too much teeth. And when we see too much teeth, that typically either means that there was inadequate bone reduction or the prosthetic is too thick. Another patient we can see inadequate bone reduction. Another common problems that you typically get with these style procedures, you can have fractured screws, you can have double screws, and a fractured screw. There's a number of different screw removal kits. You can also use a uh, Cavitron, and Cavitron works very nicely to help remove these screws. You just run it in a counterclockwise fashion, run in the Cavitron, and many times it'll loosen those screws up. You can have fractured abutments. And I can tell you that over the years, certain implant companies, their abutments had higher fracture problems than other implant companies. And um, you know, once you deal with enough of those, you don't work with those companies anymore because <laughs> yeah, that causes a lot of problems. And um, you know, that's one thing that uh, I've been very happy with on the Norris Medical is uh, the quality and construction of their products. Uh, you can have, again, fractured abutments, fractured screws. And some of these stem from poor occlusal adjustments. And so you know, when you have this uh, type of procedure done, you want to have the occlusion adjusted to spread the force very evenly. And when the occlusion is not adjusted properly, it can result in a lot of problems. And uh, so really, really focus on your occlusion. And you know, this lecture, believe it or not, is actually uh, taken down from an eight hour lecture. And so we, you know, sometimes we'll spend almost an entire hour discussing occlusion. Uh, so it's much more to cover uh, than we can do in a lecture like this. But uh, you know, being very cognizant of your occlusion can uh, eliminate a lot of these other problems such as fractured abutments and fractured screws. Other common problems, you can have bad abutment placement, which many times stems from uh, uh, inadequate implant placement. And we can see here, we have a lot of facial access holes, which we wanna to try to avoid during this type of procedure. And that could be from bad implant angulation. And you can see some of these angulations that you know, these implants are just gonna end up failing and have problems. And so when you're doing this system or when you're doing this procedure, there's a number of different implant systems out there. You know, so which one do you choose? You know, the Norris Tough System, uh, these implants are really specifically designed for an immediate load type function. So if you look at the implants, we can see that apically, they have a very specific design. They have very sharp, end cutting threads, V-shaped threads in the apical portion, because that's where we're wanting to engage the hard, dense type one bone or 
uh, to get our higher insertion torque. And then if you look more coronally, we could see that we have compression threads. And so these compression threads are going to, again, help give us some increased stability in some of these areas where you may have softer bone. And then at the very crest of the implant, we have micro threads. They're gonna help prevent crestal bone loss. And so uh, this design is a very specific design for uh, immediate load procedures, all on X style procedures, because we're looking to gain very high amounts of insertion torque. And this implant is doing that really specifically because it's designed that way. And if we look at the sizes of this, there's a variety of sizes where we have sizes for minimal amounts of bone in the 3.3 all the way up to 6.0. And I can tell you in today's case, I utilized a variety of different sizes. And if there wasn't all of this options for me to choose from, I would have been in trouble with today's case in particular. And you can see that the sizes in terms of length for these implants are pretty robust. We're in the 4.2, for example, you go from six millimeters all the way up to 25 millimeters. And in many implant systems, they just don't have that uh, variety of size. Um, this gives you a lot of options because when you're doing these procedures, many times you don't know exactly what you're going to run into. Sometimes you need a longer implant than you anticipated. And by having these implants in stock of all these variety of sizes, it can bail you out of a lot of different situations. And having a larger diameter, the 6.0, there's many companies that do not have a 6.0 diameter implant, or they don't have a six millimeter implant in terms of height. And those can really bail you out of many, many situations. So having this wide variety of implant stock to choose from, it really allows you to treat virtually any situation. Then we look at the Terry fit implants. These again are designed for specifically immediate loading because we have very similar to the tough implants, a very aggressive end cutting tip with V-shaped threads that's going to uh, cut through uh, dense cortical bone, giving us very high amounts of insertion torque. And then coronally, we have, again, compression threads. So when we're in softer bone uh, towards the crest, we can compress that bone. And then in the pterygoid region specifically, because many times we'll have thick tuberosity tissue, we have a smooth polished collar, and that's going to reduce the uh, adherence of periopathogens to this implant surface because we have a nice smooth polished collar. And again, again, a specific pterygoid style implant design. Now, some of the tough implants you can use for placement in the pterygoid area. And matter of fact, I'll show that in just a few minutes. So in this, our pterygoid implants come in a variety of sizes, 18 to 25 millimeters and in a 4.2 uh, a millimeter diameter. And then finally, we have our zygomatic implants to choose from. The zygomatics, we have a range of 30 to 60 millimeters in length. Now, this is a very specific design. So with this design, we have 12.5 millimeters of apical end cutting uh, resort blast media treated uh, implant to engage the dense bone of the zygoma. And then the remainder of the implant is a smooth, polished surface because this portion of the implant is not engaging bone. This is the portion that is extending down from the uh, zygoma down to the arch where we're going to engage our uh, restoration. And we want a smooth collar or smooth body like this because it's going to reduce, again, the adherence of uh, pathogens from the oral cavity to this portion of the implant because this is really specifically designed or for an extra sinus or 
uh, approach in placing zygomatic implants. The other nice thing with this style of implant is we have a flat platform where some implant companies have a platform designed at a 45 degree angle. And the problem that I see with a 45 degree angle on your zygomatic implant is that it really paints you into a corner that you have to insert the implant where this 45 degree angle is pointing right where you want it. So say you need to turn this an extra quarter turn. Well, now instead of your abutment coming out here, now your abutment comes out here. And you know that can create a problem for you. So by having a flat platform, it gives us a lot more options in placing our abutments and we're not painted into a corner by having that one angulated platform. And so in the zygomatic implants, again, there are 4.2 millimeters in diameter. And we have lengths of 30 to 60 millimeters. And what's also extremely nice with the NOR system is the amount of abutment selection. So for full arch cases, we have zero degree, 17 degree, 30 degree, 45 degree, 52, 60 degree, a lot of abutment selection. And if you look at most of their implant companies in the full arch market, they only have zero, 17, and 30 degree abutment selections. And if you're doing enough of these cases, you have enough situations with bone angulations and no bone and minimal bone. And you find that there's many times that you do need a 45 degree abutment. You do need a 52 degree abutment, sometimes even a 60 degree abutment. And so with some of these other companies, when you don't have as wide of a selection, you know, you end up with scenarios where your prosthesis has uh, an access hole, you know, significantly located towards the palate, or you may be facially located because you just don't have the abutment selection that you need to restore that particular implant. And then prosthetic component, there's a number of benefits that I found with these prosthetics. I'd say most importantly for me, what we have found is I like these screws. These screws work very well. Uh, some other implant companies that I had used in the past, we would have problems with screws uh, stripping, problems with uh, screws breaking. And these screws especially are very nice. And also these uh, transitional prosthetic copings are very nice. They're very sleek. They have good retention. And I can tell you that some other implant companies that I've worked with in the past, these uh, transition copings uh, were much too thick um, and were not really conducive to making a sleek restoration just because they were very, very bulky. Okay, so I'm gonna finish off this lecture with showing a case that I did just today. I literally finished this case you know, a few hours ago. And so this case was an old uh, all on X style case and the patient um, was needing treatment of the bottom arch. He had some recurrent decay in the molars. He had some decay in some of the other teeth. Uh, his dentist had uh, offered him one treatment plan and the patient did not want to go forward with that. And he, based on the treatment he got in the maxilla, he wanted to go ahead and do a uh, similar treatment in the mandible. Now, some updates to this patient. This patient had de developed restless leg syndrome over the years. He had developed a pretty severe bruxing habit. And so in doing this case, what I did today was I added two pterygoid implants uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I wanted to give this patient some extra support. Also, he uh, asked and inquired at the beginning of the procedure and the beginning of the process if he could get an additional molar. Um, he said if he could get one, he'd be you know very happy about that. And to do that, we could add two pterygoids and extend the uh, length of the restoration. And then in the mandible, placed four uh, tough implants between the middle foramens and then two six millimeter implants because I can tell you on the CAT scan we had about seven millimeters to the inferior alveolar nerve and every time I look at one of these panos after a, a case it always looks like you have so much more room to the nerve but I can tell you that when you're measuring the CAT scan um, 
and you're looking at seven millimeters to the nerve and you're in the case, you know, you don't get any awards for getting as close to the nerve as possible. And you certainly will get some paperwork in the mail if you hit the nerve. So, um, you know, if I can be a little bit more conservative and be away from that nerve, then I'm happy to do so. And I can tell you that with these six millimeter implants on the tough line, we were able to get significantly high torque. And ideally, I would have liked to have placed this implant a little bit further forward, but there was just a lot of bone missing in this area. We were not able to engage uh, and get adequate torque there. So we had to go a little bit more posterior, but the six millimeter diameter implant was able to achieve very, very high amounts of torque. And if you look at these two implants in this particular case in the pterygoids, the difference on this side, we were able to uh, engage a Terry fit style implant here. Now on this side at my first attempt in placing the implant, I got torque, but not quite as high of torque value as I wanted. So I ended up going to a larger diameter tough implant. And when I use that larger diameter tough implant, I, I was able to get a lot more insertion torque in the pyramidal process of the palatine bone that uh, I didn't get at my first attempt in placing the 4.2 millimeter uh, Terry fit implant. So because I had these options available and I had these implants in stock, I was able to get good insertion torque for both and load that portion of the case without worrying about having any problems. If I didn't have that uh, variety of implant stock available to me, then it would have caused me some problems. And so here's the patient after the case. We can see we had pretty nice symmetry on our implants. And thought process, again, I wanted some extra support. The patient wanted the extra molar. And to do that, I needed some extra support. And then I was given this patient six mandibular implants. And so I needed a little extra support in the maxilla as well. And by doing this, we we're able to eliminate the cantilever and then support the tough implants that were placed on the bottom. And so in summary, for everything we've covered today, we talked about case selection, case planning, breaking the all and x procedure down into steps, keeping your options open because you never know what type of curveballs are gonna come your way when you're doing these procedures. And then to keep your options open, many times that can mean utilizing uh, the right implant system because certain implant systems are going to give you a lot more options and flexibilities than other systems. And I can tell you that from personal experience over the years, that the Nora system definitely gives you the significant amount of options with a implant design that is really specifically designed for an immediate load protocol and a full arch style protocol. And so in that, that concludes our lecture. Uh, I can't tell you that some of the information that we presented in the lecture today uh, I do have a textbook coming out later this summer, uh, information about uh, this style of treatment and pterygoid style of implants is going to be in this textbook and it's available at pterygoidimplantbook.com. And I'd like to uh, thank everybody for attending the lecture and uh, open the floor for any questions um, for anybody that's stayed through my long-winded lecture here. Uh, again, thank you. Okay, let me read this. Uh, I'll read some of the questions here. Um, one question we have is, uh, can we make temporary bridge from fast setting acrylic made on a putty index over, uh, placed over the implants, or is it better if they buy a CAD CAM composite disc? Um, no, you could certainly make a temporary bridge um, that way. Uh, you know, that's the way many, many people do this. Um, now I can tell you that some people will do a lot of the work in the patient's mouth. I can tell you a very easy way to do this is you do the surgery and, you know, 
again, this is uh, really an eight hour lecture and there's a whole, you know, probably a good two hours of the lecture that's just on the uh, transitional phase and the prosthetics. Uh, but what I can tell you is that what we'll do is uh, if we're using say a conventional style denture, uh, we'll have our healing caps on there. We'll then use an indexing material such as blue mousse and we'll index the denture, drill out two holes. We'll put two prosthetic transition copings on there and then we'll pick up the two copings in the mouth. And that's it, just the two copings. And you know, some people will pick up everything in the mouth, but I really think that's unnecessary. You just pick up the two, and the reason for the two is that gives you anti-rotation from picking up the two. Then you can take a simple closed tray impression. And I can tell you that for many years, we would take an open tray impression, but in doing this for many, many, many thousands of cases that we take a closed tray impression with PVS, uh, polyvinyl siloxane material, and it will give you a very accurate impression. And then when you have that impression, you can take that back to the lab, pour it up. You can then place your picked up restoration on the two implants that you picked up on the model. And now you can pick up the remainder of your implants in the laboratory, out of the patient's mouth. And it's nicer for the patient. It's nicer for you. The patient can now rest after the procedure. You can make a nice clean restoration. It's very easy to do. Okay, another question is in cases of all on four, should it be placed identically left and right? In a, uh, if you can, um, in an ideal perfect world, yes. You know, it makes the x-ray look nice and pretty. It balances everything out, but no, it doesn't have to be placed that way. And many times that's gonna be dictated by the bone, by the amount of infection that is present, the anatomy, you may have one side where the sinus extends more anteriorly than the other side. You may have one spot that has a huge periapical you know, radiolucency of infection and you just don't have any bone there to place. And so, you know, ideally what we're looking for is the total amount of insertion torque, the AP spread, and that's where certain other implants can come into play. So if you have, say, a anterior wall of the sinus on one side that is significantly more uh, anterior than the other side, that's going to limit your AP spread on that side of the arch. And so in that case, then you might want to consider maybe placing a pterygoid implant because now you can extend back, you're gonna increase your AP spread. And you know those are things to consider to balance out your restoration. And so I, every time it's not going to be exactly a mirror image of the left side and the right side because based on anatomy. Um, let's see, what is the RPM to insert a pterygoid implant? That's a very interesting question because I actually had uh, a colleague of mine come down to my clinic recently and observe me do some pterygoid implants specifically. And one thing that I had never really thought about that he mentioned to me was that he said, you know, one thing I noticed in the placement of your pterygoid implants is how slow everything was, meaning the drilling sequence, the insertion uh, sequence. And so I'm typically running the drill at a very slow RPM. Um, I'm doing some osteotome uh, condensation of the bone in that area. And then insertion torque, I typically am putting it on about 40, uh, Newton centimeters of insertion torque and just placing it until it torques out. So it's typically going at a very slow speed. Okay, let's see some other questions. Um, see, for maxillary cases, have you ever done tissue punches in the palatal tissue and then sacrifice buckle, buckle tissue to allow more robust keratinized tissue on the buckle? Uh, yes, that's uh, again. Uh, a lot of that's going to be determined by uh, how much bone reduction you're doing, where your anticipated incision line is. And so that's a very common technique. Sometimes people will, again, uh, try to palatally punch the, uh, or punch the palatal tissue and then bring that buckly, and that gives you a much more robust area of keratinized tissue. That is uh, one question that I have gotten in many past lectures is, 
uh, clinicians will ask, well, what if you have areas where there's no keratinized tissue? Do you do a graft in that area? And you know, my response to that is in doing you know, many, you know, thousands of these cases is the number of times I've had to do a graft has, has been very few because typically you will have some keratinized tissue in areas and you can rotate or manipulate your flap to bring keratinized tissue from point A to point B. And, you know, if you're doing these cases, I would really highly advise people to uh, really be very proficient in their suture technique. Because many times I see people just know maybe one or two types of sutures. And, you know, if you really are proficient with your suturing, you can really make the tissue do what you want it to do. And, you know, I've seen many times where it looks like we're going to have a huge open gap or you're going to have tissue that is just uh, covering the abutment. And, you know, with a little tissue trimming, you know, tissue uh, you know, suturing that's going to evert the tissue and then tissue, you know, suturing that's going to pull the tissue one way and then tuck the tissue down. You can really manipulate the tissue and do what you want it to do with the suturing, but it really takes knowing, you know, what that suture is going to do. And, you know, I find a lot of times people just don't know how to make the suture do what they want it to do to get that tissue in the spot they want it to be. Um, let's see, another question is, uh, maximum dimension of cantilever when you don't have pterygoid implants. Okay, well, in, uh, as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm writing this textbook on pterygoid implants. And in doing so, you know, I did quite a bit of uh, lit review on cantilever length. And what's interesting is, you know, we have this mantra of 1.5 times AP spread for cantilever length. However, if you look in the literature, there is a wide variety of numbers reporting in the literature. So for example, uh, there was a study where in terms of uh, AP spread, they found the highest amounts of success was when they had you know, about 0.5 millimeters times AP spread. And conversely, there was another study where they found when they had over 2.1 times AP spread or less than two times AP spread, there was no difference. So you have one article reporting 0.5 times AB spread, and then you have another article reporting more than four times the length of the cantilever of two point you know, times AP spread, and they both reported good success rates. You know, so if you're looking for literature to support your actions, you, know, you can really find articles one way or the other. Now, I can tell you personally, that longer cantilevers I've had more problems with. And so that's why I've changed my technique over the years to try to eliminate cantilevers or shorten them if possible. So pterygoids work great for that in the maxilla. Uh, short posterior implants work great for that in some of these uh, more atrophied posterior mandibles. Um, so I try to, on average, adhere to the 1.5 AP spread rule. But again, it's going to be very patient specific and situation specific. And personally, if I can eliminate cantilever altogether, I'm happy to do that uh, because cantilevers in many cases just don't do a lot of good at all. Okay, how do you approach the anterior wall of the sinus while placing a tilted implant? Do you eyeball or do you actually open a window to locate the anterior wall of the sinus? Okay, so in many textbooks, they'll advocate opening a little window into the sinus so you can locate the anterior wall. I can tell you that I haven't done that in probably about a decade, but that in some of the uh, earlier cases that I did that. Uh, so when I'm doing these cases, what I'll typically do is I will just simply evaluate the radiograph and look where the anterior wall is. So if I see the anterior wall of the sinus is uh, approaching the second, you know, bicuspid, then I know if I enter at that area and I'm angling forward that I'm going to miss that. So I'll do my initial two twist drill and then I'll typically, you know, place a probe in and just feel around really quick and make sure that I'm not 
poking into the sinus. And if I am, then I just go either a little bit more forward or angle a little bit more forward. And so there's really, uh, I personally don't feel that there's a need to open a window. Um, maybe if you're doing some of your very first cases and it makes you feel more comfortable, I, you can do that. And, you know, I did that for my first couple of cases. But uh, I think once you do your first few cases that you'll find that, you know, it's really unnecessary and that you, uh, you know, can reduce the little bit of extra morbidity to the patient by not opening the window and that you're able to do that in most cases by simply reading your radiograph and just doing a quick check with your probe when you're doing your osteotomy. Um, another question is, uh, how far are you from the nerve with the distal implant? Uh, ideally, I would like to stay at least at least a millimeter away from the nerve. Uh, as you know, many times when you're doing your drilling process, the uh, drilling for the osteotomy will extend a little bit further than your implant. And also when you're placing the implant, you know, you're creating uh, some bone compression. And sometimes if you're getting a little closer to the nerve, you know, there are some reports in literature where, you know, you've down fractured the uh, coronal portion of the uh, roof of the nerve, you know, the bone down into the nerve, which has caused problems. Also just some of the compression, you know, can put some uh, pressure on the nerve or some inflammation on the nerve. Uh, so I'll try to stay at least a millimeter away from the nerve. 1.5 millimeters even better. Um, question about the uh, suturing technique. Uh, it's kind of hard to illustrate the suture technique. And the best way I can describe it is we'll start with a uh, just a standard horizontal mattress suture. I always start at the midline and then have my assistant cut the tail. And then again, I'm looking at each section between the two abutments as a section, an independent section. And so if the section's short, then maybe I just need one horizontal mattress suture and that everts the tissue and now the tissue is everted. Uh, it takes all the tension off the incision line. And now I just do a couple continuous loop sutures over the top of that. And that tucks down the everted tissue and closes up the incision line. Now I have that section finished, and now I'll do another horizontal mattress to go around the abutment. And what's nice with doing a horizontal mattress around the abutment is when you tighten up the suture, it literally sucks the tissue up around the abutment and hugs it really nice and tightly. And so now that takes me from the first section to the second section by doing the horizontal mattress around the abutment. And then I just repeat the process, some more horizontal mattress sutures. And if it's a wider section, then maybe I do two or three horizontal mattress sutures in that section. And then I just go back and continuous loop over the top of it. And then I just move to the next section. And then once you have it all done, you just do your last loop, tie it off, cut it. So you basically have a tail at the front and a tail at the back. And you don't have, you know, 27 tails suture sticking out everywhere uh, when you finish, you know, compared to when you're doing a whole bunch of interrupted sutures. And let's see. And let's see. And one other question was, what about avoiding the uh, anterior loop? Um, so that's, again, something that you can see in your uh, cone beam evaluation, if you have an anterior loop or not. Um, you know, I'll say you, you end up seeing it a lot less than you think. And, uh, you know, to avoid that, you know, it's really just uh, looking at the amount of bone reduction you have and your angulation of the implant. And usually I'll try to stay, you know, about a millimeter away from the loop. Um, haven't really had a whole lot of issue with that. Now, a question I, you know, do get sometimes is sometimes you will see you have your anterior loop of the inferior alveolar nerve that then you know, exits at the middle foramen, but then you'll have another branch, like an incisive branch that continues on. And sometimes they can be quite robust. And um, what I can't tell you is that um, at that portion, if you engage that, I, I found over 
doing many, many of these cases that it does not cause any issue that, you know, if you have teeth remaining, that sometimes you can get, uh, you know, a cessation of a, a woody feeling, um, you know, especially if you're doing like symphysis grafts. Um, but when you're removing all the teeth for this procedure, uh, it, I, I really haven't found that it's caused any issue at all. Uh, another thing that I, you know, will see in textbooks a lot or, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, never wanting to place an uh, implant in the midline of the mandible because you may have insertion of the lingual artery and sometimes you can even see a little small insertion in there. And, and I can tell you that, um, you know, we've engaged that portion of the mandible just countless numbers of times. And I can tell you, even if you engage that area, that the bleeding there is typically very minimal. And then when you insert your implant, it uh, obstructs and occludes that and closes everything off. And you know, personally, that's never really been any issue in you know, all the cases that we've done. And certainly if it was a huge insertion, we would avoid it, but most of the time they're very small. And I think that looks like that's the majority of the questions. Um, so if there's any other questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them. Otherwise, uh, it looks like we're finished and uh, I appreciate everybody's attention and spending time with me on your Thursday night. We want to thank everyone for attending the webinar today. In the chat box, we have the information of the sales reps in your area. Please read through them. If you would like to contact anyone on more information on Norris products or upcoming webinars, please feel free to contact these reps. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Bye-bye.